Today's text is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. Would you please open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. Shall we read together? Join me in the reading of God's Word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. Reading together. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, <coughs> that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. This is... God's word that we read. Dear folks, week after week, day after day, I have stood before you to preach the word of God. And not once have I, I have been embarrassed or troubled about preaching God's word. It has been my joy because in, my past 20, in the past 20 over years that I have been part of this church, the Lord has been so greatly pleased to bless my life with the understanding of God's Word. And you are my witness that the more I live in obedience to God's Word, the more blessings the Lord gave to me. And I have not been embarrassed to preach to you what the truth of God's word is, even though it disagreed with some of your opinions, even though it disagreed with myself and my convictions before. Because the word of God that we have, the Bible that we hold in our hands and read, are the unmistakable counsels of a true and ever faithful God. This Holy Scripture, God's Word, the Bible, is a marvelous guiding light to all who receive it with faith and obedience. That they may not go, that, that they may not grow up in the darkness of this world, the darkness of sin and corruption. In Psalm 119, 105 we read, Thy word is a lamb unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Likewise we read in Psalm 19, verse 8, The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Proverbs 6.23 says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the ways of life. Now all these verses that I just read, Psalm 119105, Psalm 19 verse 8, Proverbs 6.23, all teach us so loud and clear that everyone who loves the Bible will be led to greater righteousness, to the greater blessings of God. But those who stumble at God's word, those who ignore the word of God, they will live a life that bear the consequences of their own sins. In this way, my dear folks, I'm glad that the Lord has given me 20 over years in the history of this church 
to stand before you and clearly, emphatically preach to you the truth of God's word. It was for your blessing, your salvation, your sanctification, your prosperity in the Lord. And I have no regrets and I thank God for that. I have not hid anything from you. But it is some of you who decided not to follow fully. Having existed as a church for 25 years, as we rejoice in God's goodness, it's time for all of us to think. How thankful we are to such efficient, such unmistakable, clean wisdom that God has revealed to us in His Word and through the preaching of the same. You know, my dear friends, I want to repeat this again before I get into the text. I see the wisdom and power of my Lord and my God shining through every word, every line, and every page of the Holy Bible. My conscience is held captive, as Luther said, as your pastor, I fed you. Day and night, I worked hard, and I thank God. And our church, our elders, our leaders stood by this Bible and faced the test of time for the last 25 years. When darkness of horror have descended upon us, the thick clouds of false teachings, the blackness of sin, the gloom of gossip, jealousy and schism, the precious truths and counsels of the Bible led us. Today we exist, not because we have not been attacked by the Prince of Darkness. Today we exist after 25 years of, of service because God has led us with the wonderful counsels of His Word. Not the wisdom of any man, but the counsel of His Word. I was a young man when I came here, only about 24 or 25 years. The burden of bearing the, the preaching and teaching and spiritual care of this church. As inexperienced as I was. As probably unreliable as I was, at least to some mind, because of my inexperience. I found my strength and hope in God's Word. I not only stood among my equals, but I stood before those who were more experienced and my teachers, because the Word of God made me wise, and I give Him praise. I have no shame, therefore, in being a preacher, in being a pastor, but I'm sometimes very saddened. This truth that blessed me so greatly, why will it not be embraced by others? Why would they doubt it? Why would they choose some part of it and then reject some part of that great wonderful book that God has given? Let me tell you my friends, this book shines before us so bright there is no d shadow. It is the resplendent glory of our God. Darkness around us may deepen and endure, but the brilliance of the light of God's Word will shine in us until we all be conformed to the image of Christ. 
And that's why this church exists. And that's why we preach the word of God. I can't help but to recollect what Peter said. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 19. 2 Peter 1 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. The word of God is a sure prophecy. Those who believe will see all of it being fulfilled for their blessing. Those who don't believe and obey will see that all of it will fulfill in their life, but for their judgment. And their sad experiences to come. Having said these things, which are necessary, I think, because we just completed 25 years. And start a new journey of 26th year, starting today. And we cannot forget what guided us for 25 years. It's not a man, but the eternal counsels of the Almighty God. And you must comply. You must. It's a solemn moment. May it never be like. The experience of the Israelites who wandered in 40 years being fed by God with manna and flesh and water from the rock and had perished in unbelief. Oh, may it never be that. None of us are better than those Israelites. And that must cause reason for concern and repentance. Not for pride. Now, let's joyfully return where we left off two weeks ago. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. Now in this text we have seen the instruction to live in love. Verse 9, but as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. We have spent much time studying this, comparing scripture with scripture. But let me just remind you the context of it so we can have the thought flowing properly. What we learned before this passage was that we must avoid fornication. And that means lust is not love. But it is defrauding. That's what Paul said. Now, to defraud is to take advantage of someone for selfish gain or selfish pleasure. Any sexual misconduct is to be understood as a counterfeit expression of love. Whether it be premarital sex or homosexual love or bestiality or adultery or whatever it be. It's not love. They will say it's love. But in God's sight, it's perversion and destruction of what He has meant in the life of God's people. So instead of being fooled by the lust of the flesh, the Bible teaches us to grow in pure love toward one another. And to love one another as brothers. And so the commandment as touching brotherly love. He says, you need not that I write unto you. There is no need for me to talk much about it. Because he says in verse 9, you are taught of God to love one another. Every Christian is taught in his heart by God to love. And the last Lord's Day. Or two weeks ago when we studied this passage, we learned that Apostle John makes it so clear. No born again Christian can afford not to love other born again Christians. 
If God loves you and if God loves another one, then you will be told by God to love the other one whom God loves. And I do not want to go through all those passages because we love it much to know them. So if a man refuses in his heart to love another as God commands, then he is still in spiritual darkness. He has not even crossed over from the darkness of sin. Pastor John in his epistle makes it abundantly clear. So the love that the Thessalonians had for Christians was something that God has instilled in their heart. The love that God gives in my heart toward you is something that I must appreciate with thanksgiving because naturally it's not in me to love anybody. It's not in you to love me or anyone. You know, I'm not talking about love for your own praise. You know, sometimes we love to show or we, we like to show that we are humble, we care for others just to get self-praise. But that's not what we are talking about. Loving others is not for self-praise. It is to sacrifice ourselves for the benefit of the other. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. And the church in Thessalonica, as I explained to you last time, was committed to love others. Because many of the Christians in that church were persecuted, they lost their dear ones. Some of them were chased out of the house by their spouses or by parents because of their love for Christ. It was a persecuted church that was in great need, the great need of comfort, great need of financial support, great need of, you know, guidance and help. And there was, therefore, a great outcry for love. And they gave it. They gave it so much that in verse 10 we read, And indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. Not only in the city of Thessalonica, Christians were known for their love for one another, but their love has overflowed that city and gone around the region and people who live in far-flung cities could see that these people were truly born again. And God's love was at work because they start to sacrificially love people who were nearby and who were far from them. But then when you look further into verse 10, pay attention to this now. Paul there said, We beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. In other words, he's saying that we urge you, my brethren, to excel still more. What is he saying? Well, he is saying that you're doing fine. You're loving. We can see it. People, people from other parts of the world talk about it. Even they also experience your love. <coughs> but <coughs> you could do better. You see, the point is this. They loved, but their love is not perfected yet. You're talking about loving others like Christ loved. Now that's a high call. It's something that we haven't reached that. There is a need for greater and more genuine expressions of love. Even in a church, church like Thessalonica. Then how much more in our midst? We need to love more and more. Please remember, love is not tolerating sin. Love is not patting on somebody's shoulder who is un unrepentant to say carry on. Love is calling others to purity. And sometimes love for others can mean rebuke. And sharp words of rebuke when they are relentless in their disobedience. So you see my friends, when you start loving someone, 
you would realize you need more power to love them. I'm sure my wife learned that since the day she got married. Because she realized all the love with which she married me was not enough to stay as my wife. She needed to love me more. And that's the same with me. I came to this church. I sought love. But I realized I have to give love more than I seek that love. And that's why the Lord Jesus brought me to this place. When you love someone, there will be greater necessity for patience, forgiving others, for generosity, for sacrifice. If you are not willing to commit more and more, let me tell you, you will not succeed in loving the person that you have chosen to love. Your love will suddenly end when you refuse to give any more. So love is never going to be stunned in its growth. It has to grow on and on and on and on and on. That's why Paul says to the Thessalonians, increase more and more. When you first came into this church, I'm sure you experienced love from others. We praise God for that. When I first came, as I said a while ago, I was loved, but I found soon that I need to give more love than what I received. It's the truth. Nobody can ever escape that. If you have not realized that yet, I'm telling you, you will realize that there is a need in this church that you love the rest of the people who have already shown their love for you. You probably have to grow to a stage where you can love them more than they loved you. So please don't join a Christian church which is faithful to the Lord thinking that I am there only to be loved. But go there thinking this. The Lord has brought me here to love others more and more. What does that mean? When in the beginning, nobody may offend me because I have not yet known everyone. Because I have not yet engaged with others. Everything looked very smooth. But the moment I start interacting with someone closer, the moment I take responsibilities, the moment I had to deal with others, then I'm exposed to their weaknesses, their idiosyncrasies, their mistakes, their defiance and rebellion. And so I need to pray for the grace to forgive and to respond in meekness and tenderness of love. So Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 4.8, just as Paul says, And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Even within the church, there are offenses, there are sins. Only love can overcome that. And when you are so easily offended, let me tell you, my dear brothers, whether you like it or not, love is not perfected in you. A brother in this church may offend me, but that may not be the offense of the entire church. When somebody offends me, the church cannot throw him out because he offended me. But the church needs to work to restore that brother to the right spirit and right attitude. And that first of all begins with me, the one who is offended by that brother. It doesn't start with the pastor or elder, but it starts with the person who is offended. Now please remember, it's Pastor Paul talking to the congregation to do the work of a pastor's love. He was away. He cannot exercise the pastoral care at this point of time. So he tells the people, you do the work. 
You love one another as brothers more and more. So in this church as well, my dear friends, when we serve the Lord more and more, we realize that there's so many people, there's so many areas where love is required from me. Be part of, a, part of the church choir. Be part of children's ministry. Be part of evangelism or encourages ministry or seniors fellowship or adults fellowship. Be part of ladies fellowship or any other ministry. Soon you will find that you have to learn to love. Even when you are offended. Even some, when somebody pass a remark carelessly, you should, you have to pray to the Lord for the grace to overcome that hurt that you felt. Yes, this is what the Lord wants of us, to live in love. We must have a commitment to increase in love. Not in receiving love alone, but also even more, fervent charity toward others. That's what the Bible requires of us. So, let me ask you, why are you here in this church? You can gladly say, so that I may be loved by others through the Lord Jesus Christ to strengthen them. And also that I may love others through the Lord who strengthens me. That's why we are here. And so in your marriages, there will be offenses, there will be sadness, there will be doubts, there will be problems. There will be sickness and weakness and unthinkable problems. But you must pray that you will have love that overcomes all the odds of life. That you may remain together for the glory of God and serve Him. I must say, this is not about just our church. It's not about just church, loving people in this church alone. I think it's time for Gethsemane to ask this question. When I say Gethsemane, not just as a church, an organization, but as members as well. Has our love gone beyond our church to love Christians in our sister churches and in other faithful churches? Do we only give for our own people's need? We will only attend to our own people? You know, the greatness of Life Bible Presbyterian Church under Pastor uh, Reverend Timothy Toe was it was a church that not only loved its own people, but it went beyond that. Any time they would help. Any daughter churches. I, I doubt whether there is any church in the early history of BP that it was established in Singapore that didn't receive the loving support of that pastor and that congregation. And now the new congregation that came out of it, True Life, which was first pastored by the same pastor, Timothy Toe, and now by Reverend Dr. Jeffrey Koo, I still think they are a very generous congregation. Do you know they give gifts for our staff workers? They put offering inside saying, Pastor Koshi, $100, or $1,000, I don't know what, or, or Brother Calvin Lim, or Preacher Daniel Lim. They do care. And they do give to our missionaries. Whether it's Brother Dominino or Regor or Ephraim. They support our missions. Last year we collected $1.5 million by God's grace. Before you realize, before you woke up, the money came. You think all came from us? Yes, we gave generously, sacrificially. Praise God for that. And that it couldn't reach the needed some other BP churches who heard, we never wrote a letter for help. 
We never picked up the phone to tell those pastors or people, please help us. No, we just prayed. But the Lord moved the heart. The Lord taught them to love us. 1.5 million was accomplished. We started with a budget of 350,000. We thought that's enough. We ended up paying 1.5 million to complete the work, the buying the land and building. What great work the Lord has done because people have learned by God's grace to love and that should be our church. We must overflow. I know you might say, I'm getting old, I don't have money. Don't worry. There is nothing that God cannot do through you. Just remember this and pray for it. Lord, make me to be a true lover of souls, true lover, true lover of brethren, so that your name may be magnified. Christians are not shut-ins. Christians join hands with fellow Christians everywhere. We have been generous by God's grace in many ways, but our generosity resulted from the generosity of others as well. And so let's be in that situation, but God willing. It's time. 25 years the Lord has raised us. Now it's no more time for us to behave like little kids. Give me, give me, give me. Mommy, give me. Daddy, give me. Uncle, give me. But it's time to rise up in love and give of ourselves for the furtherance of the gospel everywhere. And may God help us. Only the Lord can do that. And he will do it, if you are willing. You could abound to a greater degree. There's plenty of room for improvement within our church, within my life and your life. We haven't reached perfection. We haven't reached. But my dear brother, my dear sister, you can laugh if you look to Christ a little more. And then a little more. And then a little more. Until your Lord says to you, Well done, my servant. Just a quick look at what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We will come to it, God willing, very soon. But just to help you to see how we should be loving and Paul himself talk about it in the next chapter. Verses 13 to 15, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. And I'll just quickly read that for you. And to esteem them, he's talking about the leaders and those who labor in God's word. And to esteem them very highly in what? In love. So love means you respect those who serve the Lord. Not just a bit, but very highly. Because of the work they do. And be at peace among yourself. That's what love demands. Be peaceful with others. Not bitterness and gossiping and, and any of that kind. Be at peace. Verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren. Warn them that are unruly. That's the requirement of love. If anybody is living a disobedient life, let's warn them. But genuine, if it's genuine love, okay, don't try to show off, I'm better than you, so I tell you what to do. No. I am of your kind. I am also at fault. I have not been right, but the Lord taught me. And gently correct them, warn them, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, look around, see who are weak-hearted, who lack confidence. Go around, pray for them, comfort them, bless them with spiritual counsels. Be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Those are wonderful expressions of love in the church. Love toward the leaders, love toward one another. So that we don't just let a brother fall into sin so easily. We persuade him with love. 
We try our very best to continue to show kindness and, and readiness to minister to those who are weak and frail. So Paul is saying to the Thessalonians that if you truly love others, you need to concentrate on the needs of the people, on the spiritual needs, and of course, even physical, showing hospitality, pre preparing a meal for them to eat if they don't have anything to eat, washing the feet, taking care of them when they are ill. Please, our church has to grow in all these. I thank God the Lord has helped us thus far. I've been urging Brother Jeremiah Sim and Sister Gina to think more about the old folks. The Lord has placed that burden in me in the late 90s. In about 1995, 96, there were persistent reports in the newspapers and TV about old folks uh, being lonely and the number of elderly in, the church, in, in, in our country is on the rise and they need greater care. Having read it and being burdened in my heart, one day I called one of the members and told him who had a motorbike, he said, would you please take me around? I want to go to all these old folks and see I mean, old folks' homes and see how things are. And by God's grace, he took me on his bike and uh, we went to two or three places. And I told them I'm a pastor and I have a burden in my heart to preach the gospel and take care of the spiritual needs of the elderly folks. Would you allow me? Two of them shut the door. But the third one opened and there was lion's home for the elderly. At first it was in Bedok South Avenue 7 and now, now they have another one at Topayo and they opened that to us as well. And I used to be every week going down there. It came a point that I can't manage. Then Brother Stephen Amp came into picture and asked him to coordinate. He did well. Then the Lord raised Jeremiah Sim, and I knew it was time for him to take up that work. And I've been telling him, let's do more than just as the gathering, because there'll be people out there, Christians, lonely, abandoned by p children. And there are many in this rich country, and they need the gospel. What more can we do? Let's do it. Because sooner or later we will be in that situation and we will understand what it is. When we started, our dear elder was not yet retired. Now he is part of seniors ministry. I didn't start it for Elder Ma. <laughs> but right now he and his wife is in it. And my wife was saying about a few months ago that Mrs. Ma asked her, why not you join seniors ministry? And she said, when I am over 50, I will come. And the other day she whispered to me, boy, that's very soon. <laughs> <laughs> so we are ready to get it as well. What other needs we don't know? The Lord knows. It will require more, more agility, more commitment, more fervency, more sacrifice from all of us. Which church can do that? A church that loves. A church that loves more and more. And that's my prayer. If the Lord would permit me another 25 years. That's yes, a very big dream for me. Another 25 years with all my sickness and struggles in life, I'm not sure whether I will live that long. But if the Lord permits, I pray that we will be a church that loves one another, driven by the love of God, 
we spread the truth without compromise. We show the love of God among us and beyond us. Mm, how to love more? Come to the next verse, please. The Lord has not left us there because loving more means more deliberate actions from us. And now we shall look at verse 11. And that he studied to be quiet and to do your own business. Now please don't stop reading at the word quiet. If you love others, just be quiet. How come you're not talking because I love others? Because in King James Bible it is said, you must study to be quiet. No, that's not what it says. Please understand it in the context. It's very clear. I, it says that you study or you discipline to be quiet. What does that mean? He explains it. To do your own business. And then he goes on to say, to work with your own hands as we commanded you. If you love others, first of all you have to take off yourself. If you are a lazy, messed up person, you can never show love for others. If you are disorganized, if you are unequipped, if you are much, not matured, how could you take care of others? There's no way. You want to say, I want to support others. Pastor, trust me, I will support others. But then you don't work hard. You have 10 acres of land and you don't plow it. You don't sow it. You got good intelligence, but you don't put it into practice. You are lazy. But let all Christian men rise up and work. And let there be no lazy, disinterested Christian men. Let's don't hate sweat. The Lord said since the fall of the man that man should reap. The harvest with the sweat of his breast, I mean, sweat of his eyebrow. There is no way you can ever walk around without that burden in your breast. That the Lord is requiring me to pay attention to my things. And I've said this to young people all the time. If you study, it is not to show off your intelligence, but to serve the Lord. That you will attain the kind of profession that the Lord would give to you so that you can bring whatever the Lord gives to you for your own family's support and then the support of the church. Angels will not bring their salary to us. It's not their duty. Yes, God can send the angels and meet our needs. But I don't think God will send his angels to a group of lazy men to help them. You know, if God does that, they will become even more lazy. God wouldn't do that. So if we are going to be a loving church, let's take care of ourselves. Let the pastors prepare the sermons with utmost diligence. Let them pay attention to the work. The care of the church, the administrative matters, the care of the soul. Let the elders do their work clean and neat. Let the deacons do their work patiently with great diligence and meticulous attitude to the work that is at hand. This is not a place for sleepy, disinterested, lazy people. You need to quieten your heart. I tell my boys all the time at home, 
There are so many things that call for your attention. Your friends would call you. Uh, you yourself would like to try out this and that. But don't forget the work that God has given to you at hand. All the rest of the things can wait. Because they are distractions. If you have accomplished this, then you go and play games. It's okay. Game is not the first thing that the Lord called you. Do the work. Pay attention to your business. You look at that verse carefully. To do your own business. Every man should know what is his call. If the Lord calls you to be a teacher, that's your business. And that man should be a good teacher. But of course I know that if you're not careful, the teaching career can take you away from God. For sure. If you're not careful, you will end up teaching ungodly things to your children. The things of this world. Things that this secular world would demand you have to teach. So it's not an easy thing to be a teacher. If you are going to be a doctor, if you are going to be a nurse, you also will have your temptations to overcome. There will be your temptations to practice abortion, which you can't as a Christian. You shouldn't. And you must stand up for that. You shouldn't just join the crowd. There are things that are ethically wrong in the medical world. Christian doctors must deliberately stay away and they must say, I don't want the money that comes through those practices. Because they don't honor God. If you are a businessman, you must pay attention. There are many ways to make money. But that which is not pleasing, I do not want. Pay attention to your own business. And make sure... What you do will bring honor to God first of all. Then God will bless. He will test your faith. He will test your commitment. And I want to tell you, don't run around all over the place. There are some people who start a business there. Two months later, they go and start another one. Then they think that guy is making more money. They drop this and run there. Please, they will never make money. They're after money. No, let's not. A Christian shouldn't be like that. Changing job every time until they have no more job. Changing business until they can't hold any business. Yes, I do agree. Even though you worked in a company without change for 20 years, you can be retrenched. Then that's different. God's providence allowed that for your test and the law will take care of you. I know you can be a hard-working businessman and focused on one business and that it may take a long time to thrive. That's okay. I'm not saying you can't change that business or job, but don't do it at your wish and whim. Make sure it is God's will. Sometimes I get tired praying for people and they ask us to pray. Lord, uh, Pastor, would you pray? I'm looking for a job. Or I'm Praying for my business, okay, we pray. And I think it's my duty to do so. But when I do so, after a few months, I come back and say, I quit. And I say, hey, so what is God's will in your life? Where is it? And I want you to know, it is a matter of loving your family. It is a matter of loving the church. It is a matter of loving the work that God has given that you will be a responsible Christian professional in your place. Let's turn to Romans chapter 12 for a short while. Romans 12, verse 11. 
I mean, I will start with verse 9 in a way. Let love be without dissimulation. In other words, no hypocrisy when it comes to love. Abhor that which is love, evil. Cleave to that which is good. Alright, so if you love without hypocrisy, you must choose evil over, sorry, you will, you, you will, cho you will choose good over evil. Verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Now verse 11, not slothful. Now how do you prefer others? By this way, not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Whatever business the Lord has given to you, pay attention to it and do it well. With a fervent heart. Fervent in spirit means diligent, earnest, committed. I hope Gethsemane will be characterized by good professionalism, godly professionalism in the life of all the, world, all the men. Let the pastors be the best pastors. Let's strive to be. Not in competition with others. Let preachers be the best preachers. Let the deacons be the best. Let the elders be the best. You know, it doesn't mean you have to be a, a pastor of a great congregation with 10,000 people to be, a best, to be the best pastor. A good shepherd will be a good shepherd whether the number of his flock is 10 or 20 or 100 or 1,000. It's God's providence that determines how many you should have. It's God's business to determine how big your business should be, how, how well you should do, and what should your salary be. But what's most important is the attitude that you have. And I want to tell you something. If I want to look for deacons and elders in this church, I am going to look at you not just the fact that you come to church. I also see how you manage your life. I will look at your life and see whether you do give attendance to your own lifestyle. If you are a person who comes to church and never comb your hair, I think you don't deserve to be a deacon. If your shirt is always crumbled and you have such bad mannerism, I don't think you deserve to be in any position in the church. Because that doesn't show that quiet spirit with which you take care of your business. If you are a lazy student, and some students work hard but they don't score as much as others. That I understand. But if you have this sleepy, lazy attitude, let me tell you, you are not deserving of anything in the church. Now, I don't want any of you to be that way. I pray that all of us, all of us, in whatever work the Lord would give to us, be the very best. If you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of others. That's the principle. And love demands that you do well for the Lord's glory. And so that through the blessings that God gives to you, you can bless others as well. All right, let's come back to our test, uh, text and finish with verse 12. What more should I do to love others? Well, in verse 12 we are told that he may walk honestly toward them that are without and that he may have lack of nothing. The Bible says, when you deal with people who are outside, to them that are without means those who are non-Christians, those who are non-church goers. You see, Christians, when we live in this world, we not only deal with Christians. In fact, most of the time we deal with non-Christians, isn't it? Sunday you come, Tuesday night you come for prayer meeting, maybe a few fellowship groups, but the rest of the time you are in the world. Those who are working, work about 10 hours a day, at least in these days. And most of the time you interact with non-Christians. 
It's very important how you behave out there. Please don't say, now I'm out of the church. Pastor is not watching me. Elders are not with me. My husband is not with me. My wife is not with me. My children are not with me. Nobody is with me. Now I can behave among the non-Christians as I would. Cannot. That's not true love. If you are going to be a loving Christian in the non-Christian world, you have to be honest. A man of high integrity. A reliable person. A person who can be counted on to carry out his work with exactness and precision. Your neighbor should know you are trustworthy. Not all neighbors are very good. And especially you live in HDB blocks, it's very difficult. It's like PGM Hole. You can't even park your bicycle in the corridor. You may block the neighbor. And if he comes with a bad face, you better recognize why that black face. And solve the problem instead of making it even more difficult. You should bear good testimony. Walk honestly toward them that are without, so that you can bear the witness to the Lord. You know, in fact, the, verse, <clears throat> the end of verse 12 is very interesting. That ye may have lack nothing, It means that when you walk honestly with others, when you do your business quietly and paying attention to it, there will be no obligations toward others. You will not be a debtor to others. You know, you should never be a debtor to your boss. He hired you, but then you don't produce the things that he hired you for. Or you deal with, you are in a business with someone and you leave your partner, business partner or your client, or your consumer, hanging in the air, shouting at you, saying that you refuse to pay. Now we shouldn't be like that. Now there are Christian maids who are listening to me. Let me tell you, you'll be the very best. Best Christian maids. There are bosses. There are those who hired maids who are listening to me. Let me tell you, be the best mistress and master. Charity requires that. Sisters, maids, let me tell you, we love you in the Lord. But never be in a situation that you will be accused of not doing the work properly. Or not taking care of the things. Or not, uh, you know, being honest. You are given $100 to do marketing, you come up, come back with things for $60 and then you pocket $10 or $20 and give back the rest. It's a shame on us as Christians. And no Christian maids in Gatsumene BP Church should be of that kind. They must be of highest integrity and the Lord will bless you. The Lord will look after you. And so, we cannot be so stingy that we don't pay our maids or our employees. Be kind-hearted. Be honest toward others. And let the Lord use you. That you lack no testimony. You lack no provision in life. Love is the answer to all this. And may God help us. That we may be a good testimony in this world as we live for him. Right now the Chinese service will join us for the Holy Communion but before that the seniors will sing a song for us in thanksgiving to God for 25 years.